This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. We actually have a little bit of a family band. My son plays the drums. My daughter plays uh, the piano and sings. My wife is trying to play the bass. I got one for her. And she hasn't really learned it yet, but uh, we like to play music as much as possible. And uh, it's a great thing to bring the family together. You know, some families like to play golf. We like to play music. And, and ever since I was you know, five, six years old, I've always had a real interest in music. And I was growing up right at the cusp uh, of that era between, you know, 50s kind of easy listening music and then the birth of rock and roll. So it was a very exciting time to be alive. Yeah, hugely exciting time to be alive. And you sent over five of your favorite songs, the first of which is Help uh, by the Beatles. So are you a big Beatles fan in general? I was a big Beatles fan back then. I mean, I still really appreciate their music and you have to give it to them that they're likely one of the most talented groups of musicians ever assembled. But the reason I chose Help as one of the five songs that really are meaningful to me, not, not just like what I think are the best songs, but songs that are meaningful to me is, Help was the very first record that I ever bought. And I remember saving up my money. Uh, I was uh, delivering newspapers on my bicycle, saved up enough money to finally buy an album. I think it was $3.50. Went down to the music store, uh, got it, brought it back. I mean, it's an iconic album as well. And I remember putting it on the little portable record player that we had, and I dropped the needle on it. Now, I was used to, up until that point, listening to music from Marty Robbins' White Sport Coat, because these were my brother's records. He had a lot of 45 sitting around. So Marty Robbins, The Letterman, The Four Lads, people like that. That was kind of the sum total of my musical experience. So this was my very first music purchase. And I was so excited to put it on the record player. I remember dropping the needle on it. And when I heard that first, you know, multiple harmony word come out of their mouth when, when they say, hell, I just thought, what is this? I've never heard anything like it before in my life. I didn't have access to a radio. I'd heard about the Beatles before and I dropped the needle on that first track and I could not believe what I was hearing. And when you consider that album, there was 14 tracks on it. I think there was six, six or seven hits, three of which were number ones on one, one album. Can you imagine uh, artists doing that today? It's, it's unheard of. And you got 14 tracks on the album because they were all about two and a half minutes long. But it was extraordinary to have that amount of amazing music in one place. Uh, and I was blown away and that forever changed my life. Well, I, th I think Help is actually quite an underrated Beatles album because it's not mentioned as often as like Revolver and Rubber Soul and Sgt. Right. Pepper. But yeah it's full of these incredible songs. That early Beatles era, I mean, that was sort of the, more or less the final album from the kind of early years before Revolver, mm -hmm. I think. It was not- Right, you know, that was not long after they they progressed from a skiffle band into being the Beatles. And and I don't remember, I had they been to Hamburg at that point when- that Oh album, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So they, that was just after they came back. But we, I mean, you think about, you got help, uh, the night before, you've got to hide your love away. I need you, another girl. You're going to lose that girl. Ticket to ride yesterday, all on one album. You know, that that would be the sum total of some artist's complete repertoire in terms of hits. That was one album. It was really extraordinary. Yeah, I do think that they they their catalog is remarkable for its consistency and unparalleled in that sense. Absolutely. But, but, but you sort of alluded to the fact that perhaps, you know, the Beatles aren't so strong for you in terms of listening every day. Is, is, are they not like that much of a part of your listening at, at the moment? It's more nostalgia for your first ever record. 
it's the sort of thing where if my son and I get together and we say, let's listen to some really good music. We'll play a couple of Beatles tracks. Uh, the first song that he learned how to play on the drums was Come Together when he was <laughs> four years old, which is a pretty extraordinary accomplishment when you think about it. Yeah, huge. Uh, now Ringo, Ringo Starr played it differently than most drummers because Ringo was a left-handed drummer playing a right-handed kit. So he would go around the drums backwards. So he would start off on the floor tom and, and go up that way, whereas most drummers start on the rack tom and, and go down. So my son was trying to learn how to play it backwards, but he had to learn how to play it forwards. But when we go over you know, classic music, uh, he's a big fan of the Beatles as well. He's got a, a photograph, an iconic photograph of the Beatles above his bed. And here's a 10 year old kid. And he's you know 10 year old kid like I was as a 10 year old kid with a love of really great music. It's not something that I listen to every day, but when I get into a nostalgic mood or I want to hear some really good music, I'll throw a couple of Beatles cuts on. Yeah, absolutely. It can't be beat. Uh, a different type of rock music, but I mean, just an incredible rock anthem, really. Welcome to the jungle. And, uh, and, here's, and here's, you know, back to the Beatles. Here's the thing is I got, I really got into the Beatles, but I never really got into the Rolling Stones. You know, there's a couple of Rolling Stones tracks that I liked, you know, Give Me Shelter, Sympathy for the Devil, you know, Brown Sugar was a great tune, although now it's become incredibly controversial. But I was never a huge Stones fan, not the way I was in the Beatles. You know, I got into the Doors as well uh, with some tracks, but the Beatles were always, they, just about everything that the Beatles did, I really appreciated. Whereas some of the other bands from that era, I got into a couple of tracks, but wasn't really into them as much as I was the Beatles. That's very interesting because I was listening to a John Lennon interview not too long ago, and he said something like, if the Stones were revolutionaries, the Beatles definitely were and, and are and were way more so than the Stones. And everybody has this idea that the Stones are the great revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. but the, but, you know, L Lennon was saying the Beatles are way more revolutionary, like music wise. And the way he put it was power wise. I'm not sure what he meant by that, but I guess he meant the influence that the Beatles had on the kids. I'm always like Beatles when it's Beatles versus Stones. So that's interesting uh, that you say you never got into the Stones. Why has Brown Sugar become controversial? Oh, because it's about the slave trade. Gold Coast labor bound for cotton fields, sold in a market down in New Orleans. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Aaron whipped the, the women lyrics. just about midnight. You know, this is some pretty controversial line. But, what, but why, is it, why is it controversial to write about the slave trade? Uh, well, I think it was the, the way that it was written. You know, hear him whip the women just about midnight. It's, it's become less than politically correct, uh, you know, in recent, in recent years. You know, back in the 1960s, nobody gave it a second thought. But now that everybody's looking back and you know the culture and social mores are, are changing that's a sign that definitely has a lot of controversy attached to it there wasn't a kind of like a sinister vibe to the way that they were writing it controversial subject but not necessarily and, and i think it wasn't wasn't that didn't they record that at muscle shoals yeah like, as well yeah yeah so you know they, they had that southern swampy sound to it and it all just seemed to go together but you know, when it was recorded uh, back in the day, the, the lyrics, while they were probably, you know, less than politically correct, let's say now they, they've become more not politically correct. I, I don't know if the song is the sort of thing that is going to get canceled like so many other things have, but definitely I think there's a lot more controversy attached to it now. Yeah, for sure. I'm wondering when when one of those people like an untouchable, you know, I'm not saying Mick Jagger is untouchable, but he's more or less like in the same way that none of the allegations against Michael Jackson have stopped people from listening to his music. If there was some great revelation that came out against a rock god like Mick Jagger, or if there was just a witch hunt and people decided to mm -hmm. cancel someone like that, I still think someone like the Stones, they're almost like too big to be canceled. Well, you know, um, Dr. Seuss was pretty big too, <laughs> but you know, some images from his early books are, are, are clearly racist. Uh, in, in their illustration. And it took a while for people to come to that realization, though many may have in decades previous. But, you know, what was acceptable back then, even though it was unacceptable, it's now completely unacceptable now. Yeah, I do see what you mean there. Like, and so are you in favor of uh, the reevaluation of, of um, things in this manner, kind of 
to what extent do you support it? Because obviously a lot's being made of cancel culture either way is not an issue at all or this kind of great you know, it's it's Correct. it's one of those it's one of those issues that no matter what what position you take on it, you're going to be wrong in someone's eyes. I mean, I think clearly when you look at some of the illustrations in some of Seuss's earlier books, those are illustrations that are ethnic and racial caricatures, and I would say that they're inappropriate. That's interesting. Yeah. Um... I'm embarrassingly never really read Dr. Seuss, so I can't comment either way. I guess that's a bit of a cop out. It gets me out of the debate, but it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's the genuine truth. My lack of sophistication has helped me on this occasion. I mean, I, th I think that I think that cancel culture, if you will, goes too far too fast uh, when it comes to some issues. Uh, the Seuss issue is 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 one that I could definitely see the sensitivities. Mm, that's interesting, uh, but. Back to the better, uh, you know, more peaceful or usually more peaceful world of rock and roll. Uh, <laughs> why did you put down uh, Welcome to the Jungle? Um, I just really, really like the song. Um, Appetite for Destruction is uh, one of the greatest rock albums of all time. Mike Klink, who also produced an album um, that friends of mine were involved in, Triumph, uh, the rock band from Canada. They had Mike Plink uh, produce an album for them. So there's an affinity there as well. But I, I also think that it's extraordinary that a band that was as drugged out and screwed up as uh, Guns N' Roses could make music that sounded like that. I don't know if you've read Slash's book or not, but it's a wonder that any of those guys are still alive, let alone able to make music. So to think that they got into the studio and they made an album of rock music that was that good really is quite extraordinary. And I just, I love the way that Welcome to the Jungle is put together. You know, there are so many, uh, so many mood changes in it. There's not necessarily the time changes that say Rush would have in their music, but there's a lot of progression to the song in a way that it starts off you know, very quick, and then it slows down a little bit, then it gets back into the crescendo at the end. I just think it's a very, very well put together song. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the vocals as well, uh, quite- I think Alex Rose is, yeah, wait, Alex Rose, Axel Rose <laughs> is one of the best rock singers that has ever lived. Unfortunately, hmm. his voice is not what it used to be, but when he was young, and I heard a tape, I heard a demo tape uh, of his years ago, uh, and it's the one that Slash listened to when they were considering lead singers. And his voice had such a, a unique character to it and such an amazing range. Uh, it's kind of like Bon Scott's voice, mm. you know, in terms of that uniqueness of, of tone and pitch. Uh, so he was just an extraordinary singer. And the things that he could do with his voice, too, were, he, had, he had some real vocal acrobatics that he was able to pull off. And I just... It makes amazing, amazing music. Yeah, it's interesting you say that about Bon Scott because I think Axl Rose filled in uh, for Brian Johnson, didn't he? On uh, he did, yeah. ACDC tour. It's that type of. I mean, his voice, yeah, it doesn't sound the same live, but it's almost kind of impossible to do that, like to the record, to get it to sound like that live. I can't think of any singer that I've ever seen singing with that type of like. But what is it? Is it full? It's not falsetto, but it's like head voice, but like incredibly distorted. I've never seen anyone singing like that live as well as he does on Welcome to the Jungle or any of that record. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know where he puts his voice, but he puts it in a place where it just it has this 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 richness and this timber about it, while at the same time being sort of this plaintive rock wail. Which, which is why I said it's a very unique voice. There's only a handful of people who have voices like that. And Robert Plant had one, mm. uh, Bon Scott, uh, Axel Rose. I don't know who else you could put in that character in, in, in that category. But you know, they're few and far between when it comes to that sort of quality and range. Have you seen Guns and Roses live? Uh, I know, but I've seen Slash, and I've interviewed Slash a number of times as well. Wow, that must have been. Never got, never got the chance experience. to see them live, and then they're one of the only bands I didn't get to see live because I, because of the fact that I did a program in Canada uh, back in the nineteen seventies and early nineteen eighties, seventy nine through like eighty five, called the New Music, and then I was one of the original VJs on Canada's Music Channel. I saw dozens and dozens of concerts, interviewed literally every musician 
who came through town, went to the Rock and Rio Festival in 1985, the very first one. You know, went to the wow. Reggae Sunsplash Festival in Montego Bay, Jamaica in 1982. Went to Bob Marley's funeral in 1981. You know, there's a lot of miles on this body and a lot of it has to do with rock and roll. So I've, I've seen a lot of people in concert, but never saw Guns N' Roses. Do you, is there a part of you that you now cover more, I don't want to say more serious, because I take uh, rock and roll music and music very seriously, but is there a part of you that's nostalgic for those days? I mean, what, it's literally just sounds like the dream experience and job. It was so much fun. You know, obviously it was a lot of work and you yeah. know, typically because I was, I was doing things during the day in other areas at the television station that I worked for. And then I was also doing this program. So my days tended to be 16, 18 hours long. And then on Friday, when we were producing the show and putting it together, I typically get in at nine o'clock in the morning on Friday and leave at two o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday and go home and crash for a few hours. And then we'd watch the, the show. But I was going out to concerts until you know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, uh, interviewing bands. I, I, I just, I, I can't even think of how many people I interviewed. And, and what's really funny is there are a lot of new rock documentaries that are coming out. <clears throat> For example, I was on a plane coming back from India, I believe, and they had the Joan Jett documentary on the plane. So I thought, oh, Joan Jett, I really appreciate her music. I interviewed her once. Let me see what this documentary is all about. <clears throat> I get probably 20 minutes into it and boom, I pop up <laughs> interviewing <laughs> Joan Jett. And I'm in the Rush documentary. I'm, I'm in um, the Anvil documentary. I'm, I'm in a bunch of different documentaries that, that just kind of pop up because we had this amazing music library. The guy that was producing the new music show, uh, the late John Martin, who was a former BBC producer and CBC producer in Canada, <clears throat> said that the strength of our show is going to be on the depth of our library. And even though they wanted to recycle all of the tapes because tape costs a lot of money, he said, no, he said the value of this show will be in the archive of footage that we have. And to this day, it's probably the richest archive of rock interviews and moments uh, that there are. I, I remember being at U2's very first show in North America in 1980 at the Danforth Music Hall in Toronto. And they played to 400 people. Uh, you know, I remember seeing the police at a place called The Edge, where they played to 200 people. You know, saw these, all these bands come out, went to The Clash's first concert at the O'Keefe Center, which is typically where the ballet would perform. And there's The Clash, and the fans had gotten out of hand, and they destroyed a bunch of seats in this beautiful uh, hall, where people usually listen to Tchaikovsky and watch the ballet. And I remember Cosmo Vinyl, who was The Clash's manager at that time, coming along and he's counting the seats that are smashed. He goes, oh, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five. There's seven effing rock and roll fans in Canada. So that the only rock and roll fans were the ones who destroyed the seats. <laughs> so it's moments like that that just kind of stick in your mind. And it's, I mean, it was, for, for a guy who loved music and didn't have the talent to play it himself, that was a dream job. That is an incredible uh yeah, just an incredible job to have. And in, but at an incredible time as well. And it I was because... I would have rather had that job then than now. You know, it was it, in some ways that time period was like a version of the 1960s. You know, when the Beatles came out, 63, 64, completely changed music. In 1979, when we started this program, it was the reaction against disco music. Right. So all of these bands, the Sex Pistols, the Clash, the Buzzcocks, UB40, all of these bands were coming out of the UK and they were coming through Canada first because a lot of these English bands, we would talk to them and they would say, we wanted to come to Canada first because Canada is kind of a bridge from the UK to America. So we want to see because of the historic ties between Canada and the United Kingdom. We came here first to see how our music would go over with the North American audience that still has sort of some British sensibilities or some Commonwealth sensibilities to it, and then test as to whether or not that would work if we went south of the border to the United States. So I saw so many bands from the punk and new wave generation that were coming over through Canada to kind of test the waters in North America. It was great. Yeah, it must have been absolutely incredible. But so you've got this uh, very much this rock and roll side to you uh, and side to your music. But then you've put down Feeling Good by Michael Bublé. 
So when did you become more smooth? <laughs> uh, okay, so so here's the story. Now that's a Nina Simone song, of course. Of course. But the reason why I like the Buble song is I had my marriage had broken up, and I was um, divorced, and I was um, beginning my relationship with my now wife Kira Phillips, and I was at her house in Atlanta. And I was sort of feeling a little bit melancholy about what's the way forward and how do, how do we put this together in a way that it's going to be um, constructive and loving and how do you get over a relationship that lasted 35 years and, and move ahead because you were so stuck in the past and how can you look toward the future in a way that's positive and, and loving and constructive. And I was just kind of feeling down and flipped on the radio and I heard the first line of it. The first thing that came on was feeling good. Birds flying high. You know how I feel. Sun up in the sky. You know how I feel. Breeze blowing on by. You know how I feel. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new life. And I'm feeling good. And I thought, you know, that is a really, really inspirational song in order to take, put one step, one foot in front of the other and take steps toward your new life. And I'll, I'll never forget that moment when that was kind of the epiphany that hit me to say, you're not gonna live your life in the past. You're gonna move forward. You're gonna have a fabulous life going ahead. So, you know, grab it by the reins and ride that horse and just enjoy what comes down the pike. That's, yeah. I mean, it's difficult to argue that that lyric and that song is incredibly inspiring. But what I've just kind of thought about is that the music compared to the lyrics like feeling good and that lyric you'd almost normally think that it was going to go with like a super cheesy like chord sequence and backing track and both I mean obviously Michael Buble is a very smooth singer incredible mm -hmm. singer and that production's a probably more glossy than on the Nina Simone version but the actual chords and the it's quite kind of melancholic to go with that lyric it, it, it is it's a you know it's a little Frank Sinatra yeah yeah, uh, but I, and I think that's probably because it was a Nina Simone song. And I think David Foster produced that. Mm. Uh, and, you know, David Foster, uh, you know, as much of a genius as he believes he is, really is a <laughs> genius. <laughs> and, and he, you know, is, he, would yeah. re he would remain true to the origins of that song. I mean, and, and I don't know if you know it or not, but the story of how Michael Buble was discovered is remarkable. I don't know it fully. I know that it is remarkable. And I know that to just kind of, you know, he is written off somewhat by some snobs as like too smooth and stuff. But it, but uh, how was he discovered uh, for, for those people listening to set the record straight? Like like so many other fabulous Canadian artists, you know, Celine Dion, Brian Adams, uh, Loverboy and, and, and others. Um, David Foster discovered him at a wedding. Uh, David Foster was invited to Brian Mulroney, who was the former prime minister of Canada's, I believe it was daughter's wedding. And they're about to hear the entertainment and Mulroney says to David Foster, you've got to hear this kid that I got who's going to sing it at the wedding. He's, he's unbelievable. And David Foster's like, oh God, another wedding singer I have to listen to. Jesus, how many of these <laughs> do I have to go through? So he sat down and he said, Michael Bublé came out on the stage and from literally the first words that came out of his mouth, he said, this kid's a star, I have to produce him and we're gonna go forward with this. Uh, and, and, you know, there's similar stories with Josh Groban as well. He was discovered because he was filling in for Andrea Bocelli uh, at a rehearsal with Celine Dion. But if, if, if David Foster hadn't gone to that wedding and Brian Mulroney hadn't hired Bublé to be the wedding singer, there wouldn't be a Michael Bublé. And just in the same way that if Andrea Bocelli had made his plane and got, I think it was the Golden Globe Awards, uh, there wouldn't be a Josh Grove. You know, it's like, that's the thing about the music business. There are just, you know, these moments that if you miss them, they're probably gone forever, but it's just the way the cosmic, you know, confluence of the stars and the moons and gravity just kind of pulls everything together for that one shiny moment when these people become breakouts. That's very true. It is a business where you need your lucky break and you need that happenstance. But then again, I think it, the people who put themselves out there and make the effort to make that happen 
Yeah. Uh, and, and for, and for some people, it's, for some people, it's lightning in a bottle and it happens like that. Or for some people like Anvil. Do you know Anvil? I know that I should know Anvil. Heavy metal rock band out of Canada. They are literally the real Spinal Tap. And there was a documentary that you should watch done called Anvil, the story of Anvil. And I knew these guys. I did, I did stories on them. They are the perpetual, almost get the brass ring, but never quite reach it band. They, in, you know, some people got lightning in a bottle. You know, they got their asses kicked for decades, but kept trying because they said just around the corner, there has to be success. And it would come in fleeting little moments, but it never, ever happened for them. And, and again, it's a real, real life spinal tap situation. And it's almost tragic because they wanted it so bad and they tried so hard and they just couldn't quite get there. Yeah, there is it's a fascinating side. documentary. You should watch it. Yeah, I've, I think I've seen the poster of the documentary, which is why, or I've seen the ad on somewhere online, which is why I knew the name, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I feel so bad for them because there is that side to the rock business where if you don't quite make it, but you're still doing pretty well, it's not like insurance or accountancy where you can kind of be like mid-level and people are like, oh, that's very respectable. In rock, in the rock and roll, you've got to be properly successful. Otherwise, it's a bit of a laughing stock. I don't know if you. Yeah, yeah. It's not like golf where you can be a mid-level golfer and still make a few million dollars a year. You know, you've <laughs> got to be. You're either at the top or you're banging through the clubs. I was trying to make it. The lips, lips, and Rob. I've never seen lips was the lead singer. Rob was the drummer, uh, and I've never seen two guys who were more dedicated to the idea of trying to make it. And it's just, it's. You, I mean, you feel good for them because they're doing what they love, but you feel so bad for them because they just didn't quite get there. And does the documentary kind of reveal that? Oh yeah, it's all about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching that. Uh, and and Lips, is, Lips is hilarious. He says things like, well, at least we know things can't get worse. <laughs> but if they did... <laughs> Yeah, I, re I yeah, I, I feel bad in a way for enjoying a, a, a story where it's not all just uh, people going and, and you know, gawping and saying. There, there's, there's, there's redemption at the end. Though. There's redemption at the end. Well, just when you just when, I, I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but just when you feel, oh, my God, I can't take this anymore. The clouds part and the sun comes up. It does sound like an awesome documentary. I'm looking forward to watching that. Someone who did actually manage to succeed uh, and is uh, an amazing and sometimes controversial character is Kid Rock. You've chosen all summer long. Uh, how come you chose that as well? Because it is a bit of a ripoff, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant mashup of Werewolves of London and- um, I mean, I love it. But... And Sweet Home Alabama. It's terrific. And it's got that Kid Rock attitude. Uh, the reason I like that song is because that is sort of the seminal song of my wife Kira and I getting together. We, we, were in, we were in New York, we were both working in New York and things were just starting to, to bud. And um, the record company sent over to me the new Kid Rock album. And so I, I said to her, I said, I know that you're a big fan of Kid Rock. I really hadn't been that into him, but Cowboy was one of her favorite songs. And uh, I said, let's put the CD on and listen to it. And I heard this brilliant mashup of Werewolves of London and Sweet Home Alabama. And she loved the song too. And that kind of became our anthem. I mean, you know, because we were, swinging into, we were swinging into the summer and it was just a, a really good, feel good song. And I hadn't, we, I hadn't and, realized the Werewolves of London thing. Oh yeah. But obviously, yeah. And, and then we went to Mardi Gras the next year and we went to the Endymion Ball uh, which was held at the, the, the big uh, arena there. And Kid Rock was the entertainment. So 2.30 2 in the morning at the Endymion Ball at Mardi Gras, out comes Kid Rock and plays all the songs, including All Summer Long. So just, you know, That's kind of put a bow on it for us. Yeah, so it's a huge kind of sentimental meaning to the song. But uh, I did, yeah, the Werewolves of London, of course it has, has that chord structure as well. And it's nice to hear a song that where it just, does what you want it to yeah well when you listen with the opening the opening strains of the song it's it's the beginning of werewolves of london yeah you know, and then they mix in uh sweet home alabama yeah 
yeah it's a it's a great song and it, yeah because it because it came out quite recently it was good to hear that progression again it was in 2008 i think it came out even more recently i'm pretty sure no maybe, no 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 maybe, maybe, maybe 2009 you would know better than i yeah to, it, yeah i think you're right and you would know better than i as well due to the sentimental uh meaning behind it um it feels like that was quite a long time ago because it almost feels like guitar music and rock music is died even further in terms of mainstream pop culture whereas all summer long was mainstream pop culture yeah uh, but five for fighting a hundred years what's the story behind that well i know john and drastic uh he and i both shared a love of, of hockey he's canadian as well and lives in los angeles and it's just it's about the passage of time and i didn't know whether to, to give you that song or Kenny Chesney's Don't Blink. But I thought, you know what? I'm a friend of John and Drassic. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go with his song. But there's a couple of songs like that, 100 Years, uh, Don't Blink, which talks about how quickly time goes by. Uh, you know, I'm 15 for a moment. I'm 33 for a moment. Kenny Chesney's Don't Blink. Uh, just like that, you're six years old and you take a nap and you wake up and you're 25. And it's just, you really can't believe how fast time is going by. I, I like to say that the older you get, the further down on the accelerator of time your foot goes, because the older you get, time does seem to go by more quickly. You know, I look back and, and think, God, when I was doing the new music and, and much music, that was 40 years ago. That was a long, you know, 1979 was 40 years ago. And that's an amazing, amazing thing to think of. Uh, and, you know, my first set of kids are, you know, my son's in his mid thirties. My daughter's going to turn 30 this year. I've got two other kids, twins, who are now 10 years old. Yesterday they were babies and just how quickly time goes by. So I really love the way that, that John and Five for Fighting put together the progression of that song. You know, like an, an old man, you know, what's the, well, that's the Kenny Chesney song, you know, talking to an old man, but, but just the idea that these moments in your life go by so quickly and you hang on to them and then you turn around, you know, a hundred years goes faster than you think. Don't blink when it comes to Chesney or, or the Andrastic song. It's this, the same thing. It's kind of a melancholy feeling about how quickly life goes by. Yeah. It's something that I'm only starting to cotton on to fully uh, having just turned 30 uh, and I oh find gee I feel um, really bad for you <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, is that something that makes you feel does, does it make you treasure life more or do you do you like life do you like getting older do you like life passing you by no I, I, I would have loved to have been 37 for the rest of my life <laughs> 30 37 was a great age you were you were old enough to have some wisdom and yet you were still young enough to be able to do all the things that you, you like doing. You know, at, at my age now, I, I wake up and one day it's my finger that hurts and the next day it's my back that hurts or my foot hurts and I can't run as far or as fast as I used to. Um, you know, my brain's still pretty sharp, but not as sharp as it was. You know, when I play guitar, my fingers don't move the way that they used to and getting old sucks, but you know, there's nothing else you can do. You know, what's the alternative? Hope I die before I get old. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. Got a yeah. Lot of life left there's, no, to live. there's no alternative uh, at all, but it's good to hear that I've got seven years left till I peak. Yes. Uh, so, uh, well, for you, it may be, you may be 30, it may be 31. I remember when I was 28, I thought my life was over and <laughs> I didn't realize I had so much life ahead of me. And there's so many things I'm doing now that I never thought that I would have the ability or the or the the time to do. And uh, you know, life is good. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it certainly seems like you've continued moving in the right direction uh, since since 37, and continued yeah, despite, despite, despite lots of success, despite <laughs> despite that. So uh, it, there's one more uh, album to discuss because, of course, we've talked a bit about the Beatles and Guns N' Roses, but you also put down Dark Side of the Moon, which is obviously one of the best albums of all time, but why does it mean so much to you? Because I think when 
when Dark Side of the Moon came out, I was in my teens and it was the sort of thing that you would turn all the lights off in the house and you would lie on the floor and you would listen to it. And it's, well, you couldn't listen to it in its entirety because at some point you had to flip it over to go to the other side. But it was just the way that it all came together and the ethereal and orchestral feel and you know the, the punchiness of some of the songs and, and it, it was just, it was one of those seminal albums that you had never heard it's like before and probably wouldn't hear it's like ever again. And I mean, I think that's the reason why it stayed on the album charts for, God, what was it, like 200 weeks? Uh, and it was number one for dozens and dozens of weeks on the album charts. It, it's just one of the all time classic albums, but it was a, again, it brings back a lot of memories for me because it was a real part of my youth. You know, whether I was lying on the living room floor, floor listening to it on the console stereo, or whether I was listening to it in the eight track in my car. Oh, here's a funny story about that. I had an eight track of Dark Side of the Moon, and I got a car that didn't fit the eight track player sitting up properly. So I turned it on its side and I plugged in Dark Side of the Moon. And of course, little did I know, but the eight track is gravity fed. You know, the way that the track, the, the way that the tape rolls around and goes back onto the spool, it has to be flat. So I put it in sideways and it all came unspooled <laughs> in about a half a heartbeat. And there went my dark side of the moon. So then I bought it on cassette and bought a cassette player and the cassette didn't have the same problem that the A-Track did. Well, thank God. That must have been infuriating. It must have been a, like, a, like, precious, oh. <laughs> a precious gem. Uh, being lost because the dark side of the moon is unbelievable but it definitely destroys the notion that you've got to have hit singles as well did they have any hits it was all yeah, just... money was a hit off of it oh it was money a hit okay but it definitely to see it's still but, like, you know it, things like it's all about gig. the album yeah things, things like great gig in the sky or time you know those were, were definitely album rock songs and, and that was i guess it, the ascendance of FM album rock radio was just in its infancy then. Because I remember I was a teenager when I got Dark Side of the Moon. And then when I was in my late teens, early 20s, I actually became a rock and roll disc jockey at the biggest rock radio AM station, top 40 station uh, in the country. And uh, we would play money, but then uh, I, I worked for Chum, 1050 Chum AM, and Chum also had an FM station, which at that point was underground album rock radio. And again, album rock radio was still very much a fringe entity. So they would play all the album tracks on FM and we would play the one hit from it. And then of course, I guess around 1980, it all started to change and FM radio became ascended and AM radio started to die off. And FM radio stopped playing deep tracks like you know, time and great gig in the sky. But for a while there, you know, the joy of listening to FM radio and hearing some stuff that you wouldn't hear normally was was great. But I just, I love the way that the entire album was put together. Mm. Because, and again, as you said, it wasn't because they were hit, hit singles on it. It wasn't like the Beatles help where you had six or seven hit singles. There was one song that became a nominal hit, but then the rest of it was just this fabulous music that was amazing to listen to. Yeah, and I don't know, of course, you know, as you say, money was a hit. And I do remember hearing, like, when I was much younger, before I got into Dark Side of the Moon, I was like, well, money's all right, but I don't see what the fuss is about with the rest of it. And then you just get it. And I mean, I'm, I'm you probably got it as soon as it came out, but I'm talking about when I was like, you know, seven years old and my dad would try and get me into Dark Side of the Moon. Just, no, seven's a little early for Dark Side. <laughs> And you've got to you've got to be a moody teenager before you can actually get it. Yeah, and it's just the whole way through, and it's best consumed the whole way through. But it sounds like from you your discussion of FM radio. I mean, I'm very sad to have missed that era with the deep cuts getting some uh, radio play. But you've had all sorts of incredible jobs and experiences in in broadcasting. But you've this year in January launched America Reports on Fox News. So what what was the what's the idea behind that that show? Well, it's it's a split show between New York and uh, Washington D.C. and it's our only show that's really sort of split in terms of you know 
two power centers, if you will. Because of COVID, we've had to break up some shows in terms of people coming in remotely. But this is definitely a New York-centric and Washington-centric show because you have you know, the economy and some politics in New York, and then you've got all politics in Washington, D.C. We're still limited a little bit by COVID, but when the restrictions come off, which we hope will be this September and everybody gets back into the studio and we're allowed to have guests, Sandra Smith will have guests, political and economic, in New York, and then I'll have a lot of political guests in Washington, D.C. We'll go back into the studio, which is right next to the Capitol. And I think it'll be, it'll create a really interesting dynamic in that you have these two hubs, if you will, uh, that are together yet at the same time separate. And I think it will create a really, really interesting dynamic. And in terms of the broadcasting world, obviously, you've talked about coronavirus restrictions there. Everything's being conducted on Zoom. I mean, and it's been brilliant. I mean, brilliant for me doing podcasts can do hundreds of episodes in one year and I've probably people have been more available. So I can't complain too much, but there is something missing about the face-to-face -face thing. And then on the other side of it, all the art artists or big stars, they kind of they kind of like this probably now. They don't want to travel into the studio. Do you anticipate it being more difficult to get people to come in? And I mean, obviously you've got- No, it, it won't be difficult for us to get people to come in because most of the people that we interview in politics in DC are either in the Russell Rotunda in the Russell Senate office building or the Cannon Rotunda in the Cannon House office building. So for them to come across the street to our studios and have an in-person one-on-one uh, greater engagement than just looking at the camera or looking at the little camera here on, on Skype, for them is something that they're looking forward to getting back to. I, I had a yeah. quick meeting with uh, Congressman Ken Buck of Colorado yesterday, and he said that he, he doesn't like looking into the, the little thing on the, on the laptop because it just seems so impersonal. He likes, you know, politics is best done on a retail level where you're one-on-one -on -one and you're engaging with people. So we're not going to have any problem getting people back into the studio. Um, you know, maybe some people elsewhere may decide that, you know, I don't want to get up from my desk. I can just do it over Skype. And so we'll probably have a little bit of a hybrid. We'll have some on Skype or Zoom or FaceTime or whatever, and then some people in the studio. One, one thing though, that has come out of all of this that has been extraordinary is your ability to engage with people no matter where they are in the world, really, and do things that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. For the longest time, I was looking for a good guitar teacher here in Washington, and I could never find one. And because of Skype or Zoom, I, was, I began, my wife gave me a Christmas present, taking lessons from the lead guitarist of White Snake, Joel Hookster. And wow, that's amazing. I, he's in New York City. I could never take lessons from him because I'm not in New York City. My son takes uh, lessons from Jeff Plate, who is the drummer for the Trans Siberian Orchestra, and he is in Watkins Glen, New York. So without Zoom or Skype or FaceTime, you wouldn't be able to have these great experiences. And, and once you kind of get through the technology, it works pretty well. Now, sometimes when I'm taking a lesson from Joel, I have to go, where are your fingers there exactly? But for the most part, it works pretty well. And you get opportunities that you wouldn't normally have. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that, that is a pretty incredible opportunity to learn guitar of a legend like that. Yeah. And, and I'm sure for you, it, it works great too. If you want to talk to somebody who's in the UK, you just set up a Zoom session. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's worked very well in that sense, but I do, I do miss face-to-face -face interactions, live music, all the, all the rest of it. Have, have you, you said that the restrictions are likely to end in September over there. Have you found the pandemic uh, easy uh, or, or, or difficult to deal with on a, on a kind of personal and professional level? I think it's been pretty easy for me because I, I didn't really change my lifestyle a whole lot. You know, I was very careful about making, well, although, you know, I went to how many Trump events on the campaign trail, but I was, as careful as I could be about not getting myself into situations where you might get infected. I don't know how exactly you protect against it, but maybe I just lucked out. 
but we never really stopped our lives and we would get together with friends and we would have dinners and you know we still went out to restaurants that were open when they were open and we took trips and you know we spent we've got a wakeboard boat and we take the kids out on that so we we didn't stop our lives by any stretch of the imagination other people in the neighborhood did they basically locked the doors and stayed inside for a year i could never do that first of all and secondly i didn't really think that there was a reason to do that you know if you mm -hmm. take certain precautions you keep away from people you use a lot of hand sanitizer and whatnot don't spend too long in an enclosed space with people that you don't know you could probably get through it. And we, touch wood, managed to get through it. We're all vaccinated now. So I really don't have any worries about it at all. Yeah, yeah. I do welcome that attitude personally, but everybody's got their own two cents on the matter. So before uh, going, you know, before starting America Reports on Fox News, um, you were covering the White House. So I, I wasn't know. just covering the White House. I was covering the Trump White House. Well, quite. So I wanted to ask um were you a fan of president trump and how do you look back on his presidency you know i i knew him um as an individual before he ran for president i didn't really know him well like some of my colleagues like maggie haberman and john carl had done a lot of coverage of him when they were in new york my my coverage history of him was more limited than that i first met him in 2012 did a few interviews with him, got to know him a little bit. Um, and so I had that history with him. And, and I just thought, as I went through the campaign, I said to my, my colleagues, because I, I didn't know I was going to end up covering him at the White House. I said, as a journalistic exercise, if Trump becomes president, being a White House correspondent will be the best job on the planet because the dynamic will just be off the charts. And... You know, from that standpoint, it didn't disappoint. And as, <laughs> as a journalist, covering the Trump White House was one of the most fascinating things that I've ever done. And I've done a lot of fascinating things in my life. You know, covered wars, covered music, covered politics. Uh, I mean, it was a pretty, pretty incredible four years as a journalist. And, and inevitably, in the first year of the Trump administration, 5.15 in the afternoon, some crazy thing would break and everything that you'd planned for the six o'clock show, you had to throw up in the air and start all over again from scratch. The <laughs> time went by, the four years went by very quickly. There's no question about that. <laughs> and I mean, I've heard some people, I mean, I get, I've had all different people from different sides of the political aisle on the podcast. So I do quite favor a balanced perspective in general, but I've definitely heard some people sort of saying that Trump's presidency is like the worst thing to ever happen, people comparing it to like Nazism and all the rest of it. Uh, is that hysterical? You know, I, I'll leave it to others to make a judgment. What, what I tried to do for the time that I, you know, for the time that I covered the campaign, which was two years prior to that, and then the four years of the Trump administration was, I just tried to be as fair as I could to both sides, you know, because because you, when you cover the White House, you inevitably end up covering both sides. So I would just say, this is what the White House says, and let me give you the perspective on that. This is what the other side says, and I'll give you the perspective on that. You can take this information and you can make of it uh, what you will. Um, so I, ju I just tried to walk the center of the of the road if you could and not get hit by a bus <laughs> if you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing if you're watching on youtube the subscribe button is located at the top of the tom cridland youtube page it's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on youtube if you're listening on an audio platform such as spotify or apple podcasts you can subscribe at the top of the page.